So I, I, I made a project for myself. So hopefully you'll feel like listening to this, that this is something you could go ahead and do yourself. And my plan with this talk is to sort of guide you through the steps of what I've done. So it might include a bit more than what you'd normally expect, but we have about an hour, so I want to like really, so you can, you can follow it and really think, oh yeah, I could write that code, I could download that data, this all makes sense to me. And I'll show you how sort of I approach this problem. Um, so the motivation of this research was some pictures I got in my uh, email inbox. Like um, Brian mentioned, I was part of a field campaign in Barbados, and we were looking at these clouds, uh, it's a project called Eureka. And so I got this, this picture, We've got Barbados down here in the corner, a uh, load of clouds, and um, this is just to give you an idea of the scale of these patterns. So we're looking at these um, and noticing that the clouds actually organize into different patterns, and so what a group of scientists have done is they've started naming them. So they call this one flowers, I don't know if you agree, they look sort of a little bit flower, flowery-like. Uh, this, this is a different day, but it's in the same winter period. Okay, so these, uh, totally different pattern, right? Totally different thing going on. And the, the air in this region mostly arrives from the east, so there's no like mountains or anything around so the it's flowing in here. Uh, these they're called sugar, because they're a bit like sort of a dusting. Uh, this one, again, uh, same, same period, they're called gravel. And you see these arcs in here, created by cold air that's spreading out from, from evaporated precipitation. And then these really dramatic structures that they call fish, I think, because they have a bit like a sort of fish bone. So I got these in my email inbox, and I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. I wonder if a computer can do this. It seems kind of arbitrary that we sit down and name some things that we think they look like, some we recognize in real life. Um, maybe a computer can, can work this out for itself. And so that's sort of what I sat down saying for myself to do, to, to make a piece of software that could ultimately automatically sort of segment and classify subtle images into these different regions of organized collection. And the, the, the key motivator here is that uh, the clouds in this region, these um, shallow scale convec uh, convective clouds, they're really poorly understood and actually they explain um, the majority of the climate sensitivity. So uh, some of uh, people wrote a really nice review there and have a look at that. One bit about them is that they organize into these different patterns, and we don't really know what causes that, but it affects their relative properties, right? And so it's really important to then know what on earth makes them clump together, because actually, if we have different patterns occurring, that's going to affect uh, the relative balance of the, the planet, and, and getting this right for our climate projections then is, is really key. So, uh, so the, the idea would be that if you have this tool, then you could certainly say, okay, here's a region of the Earth where this is happening right now. What caused these clouds to form in this, mean, in this way? Right? So, um, so I'm, this is jumping straight into the machine learning. So then I, I looked at this and I thought, okay, I want to use machine learning. How on earth do I do that? And I started Googling uh, a lot. And so I, there's a, sort of a few things that I learned along the way that I wanted to, to bring up to you here. So, you are, you've heard of deep learning, and sorry if you've all heard this before, but I just thought it'd be good to set somewhere. You've probably all heard of deep learning and machine learning and had sort of confusion about what concepts are. And there's sort of a general, uh, like a general thing that, to follow here is that with traditional machine learning, so you might have heard of random forest, what you have to do is that you have to give the features to the model to work on. Now the features are the numbers that it works on, and they have to be quite few. You can't have like thousands and thousands of numbers. Typically, it will find it quite hard to actually extract anything from those individual numbers. And the, 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 the models can't very easily extrapolate based on what you've given it. Okay, so if you give it a lot of say, climate data, it will try and make predictions that are within the ranges of the numbers you've given. That means if you have a time series, you want to predict the future, it's actually not very good at that because it's going to have a struggle to actually project outwards, go outside its range. But, uh, so that's sort of a, 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 um, a useful tool. And then these deep learning, uh, which I'll, I'll go into detail on how they work, came along. And basically what they can do is they can extrapolate and they learn the features. So they actually learn themselves what's important in this data to actually um, make the prediction that you want it to make. Okay? So that's quite a useful distinction. So you have this tool here that can automatically find features, but they're harder 
clouds you get to do that, right? So depending on what, what, how much insight you have into your problem, if you think that, okay, uh, temperature at this given height is very important, you can make that just a feature and then you can try and predict, create a model that will uh, make a prediction based on that. Or you could use deep learning where it takes a, a, a bigger data set and actually tries to extract the features itself. I hope that was useful. So I would sorry, just to be clear, so the feature is the thing that you want to identify or the the feature is the predict in, I guess. Sorry, the feature is the input. The feature the in yeah, the, oh, okay. the so thing that it's working from. Sounds yes, like sorry. the opposite to me. Yeah, no, that's okay. I mean it's very important to ask this because okay. a lot of this is actually just jargon. Input. Yeah, it's right. the it's the input. So in this case would be like, you know, a moisture profile. Right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So so a uh, yeah, a feature that could be the stability as a, as one number. That would be something it could work on. But if it was a thousand data points to go uh -huh. in as a feature vector, it would struggle to, to make sense of that. Just you want like some kind of like bulk features of the Typically event. you want fewer numbers because it's something that you will you will try and interpret those individual numbers. Yeah. Okay. So I'll give some examples of both today. And this is sort of how I went. So I tried to do traditional machine learning first because I wanted, you know, I just want to work out what on earth this crazy field is, uh, and what these tools are. And this seems more easier to understand and deep learning, which had this like weird, you've seen these network architectures. This seemed quite cool, I'd wait for this later if I could get this working, basically. So, um, so what did I do? So I took these four images, literally the ones I just showed you, and I sliced them up into little tiles, little squares, and then for every one of these squares, I calculated a feature. So I calculated things like fractal dimension, uh, the, the standard and, um, and mean um, pixel values, so that could be something like uh, the variation in, in brightness across the tile, or uh, uh, how high up the cloud was, that kind of thing. So these are things I thought they might be physically relevant, and I was extracting those features myself. Yeah. And then I fed it through uh, a way, um, an unsupervised so a, a tool that doesn't know, uh, where I don't give it the answer, I don't say, okay, try and predict now flower, fish, or gravel. I just give it these these features, and then I want to see, if I ask it to make just four classes, do I get the classes that they started out with? Do I get the cloud types that they, they created? So, so this is a, uh, just a, a, a plot to illustrate this. So the size of this square is the number of um, tiles that, sort of, that fit into this uh, class classification. So along the bottom, you have sort of the image of the tile coming from, in, in essence. And then along the left here, you have the, the, um, the number that the k-means clustering put it in. And the, the ideal outcome here would be that for every, so they're not going to be labeled in the same order, right? Because it's just made up these classes. But the ideal would be that there's a, there's a biggest square on every column and um, row and column here. So that it appears that the k-means clustering has decided this is fish, and zero is flour, and two is sugar. And three is gravel. Okay, and I looked at this and thought, oh, this is incredible. I can't believe it. I did something super simple. Okay, I took four images. I had maybe, I mean, maybe 16 tiles out of it. You know, basically nothing. Slice it up into little squares. For every square, I calculated mean standard deviation in the pixel values and fractal dimension and other things that I, I thought might be interesting. Fed all that through this uh, Cambridge classification, and this is what I got out. Okay, so I thought, wow, okay, this, this actually does something interesting already. So maybe, maybe you can do this. Maybe a computer can itself try and find cloud patterns. Okay. And if you look at what, how it does it for, for across the data, it's not, I'm not saying it's perfect, right? But it, there are like areas that, uh, let's see if I get the order in the right, that the look it's similar, so you have these structures here. They all have similar structures to a part of the domain, okay. And this is my first approach into machine. I thought, oh, this, it's not random. There is some structure to the prediction that's made here, but it, it's, not, uh, it's definitely not perfect. So then I, I sat down and thought, okay, what is I really want to do? Well, what I really want to do is not define the features, right? Because I don't know what's physically relevant about these clouds. I don't know what it is about their structure that really distinguishes them. I, I could uh, make up a bunch like I have, but maybe they're not the most important thing. So what I really would like to do is sort of so select parts of the uh, picture here and then make the computer itself work out what's important about these bits. What makes them flowers, for instance? Uh, and then try and make a click. So I um, thought, is this possible? And it turns out this is possible. So, so Steph and Rasp and the group researchers, they did this. 
they, they hand label 30,000, uh, they, well, they've got a lot of PhD students and postdocs to hand label them images. And, um, and they trained a, a classifier to do this. So I thought, oh, that's, that's really cool. So hey, you can, I mean, it makes sense. They can recognize cats and dogs. Why not these kind of structures? Um, so that was, that was kind of done. But then what was nagging at me is that they said, well, uh, is this really the, these four classes, are they really unique? Right? Because if you train something to only recognize four things, it can only do those four things and nothing in between. So can I, can I get a machine to itself look, extract the, the patterns and learn what I like to, different types of uh, cloud organization that actually occur? And my sort of motivation things was like, you know, even in this one here they call gravel, there's actually a lot going on. There's sort of the sugary region over there, that's name, these, these cells over here, there's some linear features and this kind of thing. So what I needed was something that could, without, without, me, without me calculating the features, without me telling you what type of clouds exist, to work out itself, both of those things, which seems like a crazy, crazy plan. So, so that's where I'll go with, with deep learning. So, so I'm sorry to get to the um, Yeah. In this first example, uh, you, did, you took your four satellite images, you broke them up into tiles, and then you did your test, you got a result. Mm -hmm. um, but did you then go on and do it for like you know a lot more images? No, no, no. I, I I decided it wasn't good enough based on what I had there that I would probably need. But I mean, if you'd done like say a thousand images, maybe like your all your squares would have been more unique. I mean, with more learning, right? Or possibly, but uh, it also well, it's not certain that the features that I picked were the right ones, mm. right? So when you do say fractal dimension, you pick a threshold and brightness. Right. So you have a binary mask and then you do. So you then pick loads of numbers. I might not pick the right one. And actually, to me, it was much more interesting to have the computer work out what's the right feature there. And that's, that's what you get with deep learning, basically. So, uh, so I was thinking about this for a long time. So here's a reference for, for these names. But I think about this for a long time. Like, what is, it, what is it that happens? What is it that's distinguishing about this? Actually, what happens in our brains when we look at these images? And actually, what's happening is that implicitly, we're placing these into some sort of coordinate system. Now, I'm not saying that this is what the researchers did when they write that, wrote that paper, but it's sort of there in our minds. And I would argue this happens whenever we look at any geophysical field. We're, we're creating these uh, metrics in our head that sort of distinguish them. And, and I could have probably created this coordinate system and asked you to place loads of tiles, and you would have placed them in different regions. And so what I realized is what I need is a, um, a tool, a piece of software that takes in an image and it generates a point in, in, in here, it would be in 2D. But I also need it to be in a space that I haven't constrained, right? Because here I think that these are the two dimensions, it has to be cloud fraction and feature size. But I don't know what it is that's important, right? So, so this process of taking uh, any, any kind of data, but for example, an, uh, an image and creating a point in a high dimensional space, this, is, this process is called uh, creating an embedding. And it's actually a, a really common and very powerful tool that uh, is used not just for images but all sorts of things. So an example is Google. They, they had the, there's a very nice paper called Words for Beck that developed this. And I, when I read this, I, couldn't, I honestly couldn't believe it. It just seemed kind of absurd that you could do this. So what word select does is you feed in a word and it produces a point, right? But these points have some meaning to their relative positioning. So that if you were to look at the difference between Santa and Christmas, you get something near man, okay? And if you look at, say, the, 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 the vector going from London to England versus the one from Copenhagen to Denmark, it's, it's um, it's learned the relationship between a country and a capital city, okay? Which is kind of absurd. There's no, no one made the computer do this, right? Well, they've, they've got a, an algorithm basically taking a word and it creates a point, and it just can do that with any word you give it. And then because of the way they train it, it these relationships exist in the data. So I thought, well, that's exactly what I want. What I want is I, I give it in, uh, an arbitrary satellite image, and they will put tiles that are, are similar near each other in this in some space that I don't constrain. Okay, so do you see how the where the idea is developing now? So so I have if I could make that, right? If I could make a tool that all it does is it takes an image, 
and, and creates this point in the embedding space and similar things are near each other, then I have everything I need. So the, the, the tool that I um, the tool that I use for doing this is what's called a convolutional neural network. And you've probably seen this kind of diagram before, and I'll, I'll sort of walk you through it. But the, the general idea with the convolutional network is that you have an input image, the number of uh, you know, pixels here, 256 by 256, and then for an image you have you know, three channels, RGB. You could have other stuff, but that's pretty wrong. Right? So that's, that's your, in, uh, your input, and this is, they're just a bunch of numbers. And what a convolution does is that it basically multiplies with a, a matrix that only spans a short um, uh, region of the input down to make the, the, uh, a new value in this next layer. And it keeps doing this down here. So if you imagine this, this thing here could be, for instance, uh, something to extract gradients, then it would have, it might have uh, two and minus one and minus one. If you've heard of central difference thing, this will do some figure of your mind. So that's how you calculate a gradient, right? It's a discrete approximation. And if you keep doing that, you can actually composite these down here. And so eventually, you can get from an image to a 1D vector, right? So that's, that's uh, the, the trick is making you do this, right? But this is, this is, uh, this is where I want to end up. So if, um, if you haven't heard of convolutional neural networks before, I thought I'd put this up here. This um, is a really excellent uh, resource to go and look at this. And what they've done is that they've visualized what's in those little convolutions at every layer to kind of show you what it's actually doing. So here you see the, the stencils here for the first one. And you can see the sort of gradients. Right? You've got, got the high and low values, high and low values, all sort of around like this. And if you go then down to the next layer, you see it starts compositing them to make like arcs and weird like, I don't know what it's called there, so there's like a, is it a corner here. Yeah. Um, by the way, that's Jeremy Howard there in the top corner. I, I took this from a YouTube video from the Fast AI course. Uh, I can't recommend this course enough. It's really good, like hands-on machine learning, uh, everything taught from Jupyter Notebooks. And he's just talking through this, so I just thought that was, you know, you know where to go. Um, so you go further down the network and you start building these composite features, right? Some of them are textures, some of them there's a little bit of a window here, right? And so that's what's happening inside of my convolutional network. I put into my satellite image and in the first layer it finds like gradients in these, uh, the cloud, and then you composite that and all the way down into here. Okay, so you, you've probably seen all that before and you thought, you're probably thinking, oh, well, that's all very well, but uh, this diagram doesn't help me. Like, I don't know how to do this in code, right? And, let's see, where's my, there we the slides. Okay. In essence, what every one of these layers is, is just a matrix multiplication, and then you put it through some nonlinear function. It could be as, as simple as uh, the maximum of the input and zero. That's the most common nonlinear function. It goes flat, and then I'm going to put a slide in um, but every one of these is just a matrix multiplication, right? So this thing here is multiplying all the numbers in here to make the next one. And the key is what's in that matrix. The key is like, how do you make it do that? So I'll, I'll talk you through. So that's sort of the bit here, I guess that's sort of the, the, the clever bit, which I, I found in another paper. I didn't come up with this. So the, the, so you sort of said the issue I have is that I don't know what the right answer is, right? I can't give it a satellite image and say, okay, this is definitely a flower, because I want it to work out for itself. Because. So it's not a supervised learning problem where you say, okay, this is a cat, this is a dog, learn how to uh, pick cats or dogs. But what I do have is I have loads of inputs I can generate. And so instead of, instead of, um, instead of just feeding in one image at once, I actually feed in three at once. I, I, I call these the tiles, and they, so they come in a triplet, and there's an anchor, a neighbor, and a distant tile. And you can sort of see it from here, this illustrates how I pick it. I pick one at a random point in this domain that I'm studying. I pick one, and then the other, the neighbor, so it be uh, just, just overlapping with it in a random direction, as you can vary this. And then the distant one is on a different day, okay? 
And, and what's the insight here? Well, on average, these two are going to be more similar than this one is to this one. Right. And so I, uh, I want to make the network um, create an, an embedding where these two are close and these two are far away from each other. And that, if uh, you could write that mathematically like this, you could say, okay, the Euclidean distance, when I fed it through, you know, I used my neural network, when I fed it the, the, the anchor tile through the neural network, I did the same with the neighbor, this distance I want to be small, you know, so this is the loss function, which is the thing that it's trying to make as small as possible. And I want this distance to be big, so there's a negative sign in here. That's it. Right? And so this is, this is formulating sort of in maths what I want it to do, how I want it to behave. And it's very much just building a tool the way I want it to behave. If you wanted to have a tool that works out where something is in an image, well, then your prediction would be a, a, the corners of the box, and, and this would be a measurement of how far those corners were away from the thing you were trying to identify. So. Okay, so you can, this is, this is sort of where the, 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 um, the insight goes in, is to constructing this loss function and deciding how to put it in. And by only basing my training on the inputs, but not having a, 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 sorry, by only basing my training on the predictions, but not having like an answer that it compares again, that makes this unsupervised. So as an analogy, it's not, it's not a perfect analogy, but as an analogy, it's a bit like uh, creating an exam question giving it to a class, and then looking at what the different students actually answer in the class, okay? If, uh, if a large number of them have the same answer, that could be the right answer. I'm not saying this is how I say exams, but just as an idea, okay? But you could do that, right? You could make a machine that would behave like that. So you should think that's, there's a lot of flexibility in this loss function, and, and, and sort of more uh, common neural networks very much supervised thought in mind. It's always like, okay, make a prediction and compare it to this thing. But this could be anything you want it to be, right? You could, you could say, okay, I want the variance of the thing I predict as much more. I want the third moment to be of a specific value. You just have to put it into here. Uh, but there is like an assumption that near tiles should be similar, right? There's an assumption that these two are going to be more similar than right. these two, yeah. Right. But what's the plus n for, not like the stabilization? Uh, so the plus m, good question, it basically sets the distance that I want this, this term to have. So if you notice there's a, there's a max in here, so that I don't, this is sort of for stability of the training, and probably you can make a better one. But so that if this is zero, you want this to still sort of impact the loss function, and so you set the m to be non-zero so that you set a distance. But you could play around with that number, I haven't yet, but I think it would be very interesting to do. Uh, like, do you set the size of the tile? Yeah. Is that a free parameter? That's also a free parameter. And, and um, so at the moment, I have tiles that are 200 by 200 kilometers, but you could, you could pick a different number. I, I have, um, something I thought about doing is, is actually training it on tiles of different sort of um, actual spatial sizes, but the same resolution, if you are, same number of pixels. So you could train it on tiles that are you know, bigger, um, and, and train the same network like that, and then it would learn to recognize features of different scales. I, I haven't experimented with this uh, yet at all, because this worked for me, so this is something I've got. But I had a feeling that 200 kilometers was about the right size of the things I wanted to look at. You know, I, so my, my tiles are 256 pixels, so the effective resolution is just a little bit less than a kilometer. So, you know, I wouldn't be able to recognize patterns in the smaller scale of that. But yeah, that is something I made up. Um, and, and you know, if you have a different application, you want to have a different tile size where like, the feature that you're looking at can be captured. Okay, so okay, so I've, I've shown you that neural network is basically just matrix multiplication, and then every time you have a matrix multiplication, you have a non-linear function that goes through, so that could be a max of zero and the thing, right? I haven't yet told you how, to, and I have shown you the loss function, I've told you it's important, but I haven't told you why and how it's used. So. So that's sort of the last bit here. This is, this is how to actually train your network. So you have your loss function. Uh, and like I said, this one, what I'm using only depends on the inputs. So that could here. But it could be, I could have a loss function which is like, you know, predicted some y and I had a known y and the distance would be between those two instead. That would make it supervised. Um, 
And then what happens inside the neural network is it uses something that people call backpropagation, but effectively it's just applying the chain rule. Okay, what it is, is you say, okay, I have this input with my, my current in these uh, matrix configurations, the current values in my uh, matrices give me this value of the loss. What would happen if I change one of these numbers, just one of the numbers in the matrix? Um, and so for instance, for a value down here, you say, well, well actually, it depends on um, also the changes that have happened further up in here. So in the first day, it would just be okay if I change this number and it keeps everything else constant, the loss would go up or down. Okay, I need to go that way. And then you, you keep applying that up through the network using the chain rule to say, okay, well, the, the actual derivative here, the total derivative here is actually right, dependent on all, all the layers further down. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it's again quite a simple mathematical concept, and that's, that's, all, that's all there is to it, actually. Then, then the difficulty is working out, okay, how big a step should I make? I've now worked out how to change my, the numbers in my matrices. So, and they're called weights, by the way, I should, I should have said that. Uh, I now know how to change, or which direction to change them, and now it's a question of what, what, how big a step do I want to make, because I don't want to go too far. And so you'll see all sorts of uh, approaches to do this, um, sort of variations of gradient descent, basically. Um, but, but that's sort of fundamentally what's going on in the HUD. Okay, so I think that's probably enough about the background. So I'll, I'll now go back to the actual application and then hopefully convince you that this thing actually works and, and show you a bit about what it does. So this is a, a, just the first 150 anchor tiles I had in the, the first big training set that I used. And hopefully what will spring to our eyes is that this is a mess. There's all sorts of cloud structures in here and actually you'd be hard pressed to say there was just four like flour, fish, sugar and gravel going on in here. And I, I should say that in that original paper, their classification accounts for less than 50% of all the scenes that they looked they were just the ones they could agree on. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff going in, and this is exactly what the neural network see. It's a total, total mess. Okay. Um, so that, okay, so that's the input. Okay, so and what does the output look like? Okay, well I, I explained that what the network produces is this embedding, which is a point in high dimensional space. Fortunately, we find it very difficult to visualize things in more than 3D. So what I've done here is I've plotted the first four dimensions. Uh, the first two against each other here, and the, the fourth or fifth. Just, just randomly, I just, I just picked some dimensions to sort of show you what this looks like. But what? How many dimensions in the vector? So in this training, uh, is I got, I got 100. So I, sorry, I put it on a previous slide. I forgot, so. It's 100, 100. Yeah, so it's huge. It's huge. And, and, and actually, these things are probably not different in 100 ways, right? So it's probably too big. And that was one of the things that people looking yesterday in the class is, is there a is there an optimal number to go towards? My gut feeling with the 100 was that it just, I was trying to give the network space and to have mm -hmm. places to position them in that embedding space. Um, but what you can see is that there's these sort of, uh, almost like surfaces definitely in here, and also there is some gradient in features. It's not totally obvious, but these are probably more similar than the ones up here. Uh, maybe this one here. There. But this, this isn't a very good way of interpreting it, but actually you kind of hardly say it's doing anything useful here at all. Another thing you could do is you could take one tile and then you could sort by distance in the embedding space. And hopefully you feel like this is less messy than the one I saw tile I showed you just a moment ago. So I sorted by including distance in this hundred dimensional space and going along each row the further and further away. So you see bigger and bigger clouds down here. And again, I'm not arguing this is perfect. We could sit down and we could probably do this by hand and move them around subtly, and so we were happy with that. But my point is, you can feed a huge data set at this, and you could stop saying here, and say, okay, now I'm happy with everything above this line. What is the mean profile that these were in? What is the moisture near the surface, whatever, that these up here? And then versus everything down there, right? So you can already use it as, now it's being basically used as like a filtering or sorting tool. Another thing you could do is actually look at the clustering in the embedding space. So here I've used a type of clustering which is called hierarchical clustering where the clusters, 
as you subdivide are, are guaranteed to sit inside of each other. So you see this uh, hierarchical clustering at the top, and I've, I've stopped here uh, at a point where I was, I was just interested in what do the cloud structures look at this point. I'm not, I'm not saying there are necessarily uh, 12 distinct cloud types. What I am saying is that, that these, uh, these sort of cloud structures exist in this hierarchy so that these over here, and that this is what the network is telling me, are more similar the, the, to each other than they are to everything else. Right. And you can see that it's like cellular patterns stringing out, ones of there are more gaps in it. Um, this, this one is, is very distinct. You can see the sort of numbers here at the top show you how many there are in each group. There's, there's a lot, lot more of these here. And again, if this is messy, though, my, these are the random examples. So I took the randomly located things and fed them in. And these are random examples I'm showing. So they could be very far from the cluster center. Just, just randomly picked. Um, I was assuming. But of course, like the, the, uh, the thing to actually do is to say, OK, well, are these physically meaningful? Like, do, they, do these cloud, if I took, say, the, the 12 that I had on the previous slide, do they have physically meaningful different, uh, different properties? So at the time when I was, uh, when I was doing this, uh, there wasn't a long wave, short wave data set for the, for the, for the GOES satellite. And so what I did was I, I picked two channels that were, um, that were in the range of short and long wave. And then I, for every tile I plotted here, live for tile, and then I, I, I put the, the mean and the standard area of the mean for each of the clusters and highlighted the nearest time. And the point here is that you, you should see that these, for one thing, that the, the mean is, is very well separated. So if you just keep this randomly, right, right, they will all be on top of each other if you just do it across the entire data set. But actually, the, the, they're separating out really nicely. And, and you can probably, I mean, Brian pointed out to me as well, but it's, this, it's probably cloud cover that's really explaining a lot of this. Um, so first order, but you can see them separating out with horizontally and vertically. And I should say this this wasn't an input. This did, this didn't go into the training, right? The uh, channel nine that that is not in the visible range, so it didn't go into making these images. And it, yet it's still it's still got some separation in that direction. Okay, but again, so you could explain this possibly. This is simply just cloud cover. Maybe that isn't very. You know, I could have. If you just calculated the, the mean amount of cloud on every tile, and there's no point in training this huge neural network to give me that answer. Uh, but if you look at something else, which is the, the sort of the, the structure and shape of these uh, clouds, then you, then you get something really interesting. So here I've computed um, a, a metric which is commonly used with collection, uh, at least simulations of collection. It's called the um, IOR, this organizational index. Basically, it measures whether some uh, clouds are randomly distributed or they come together, sort of thing. So you've got one being uh, all in one blob and five completely random that look like a Poisson distribution. And then along the y-axis, I can't tell what this fractional dimension again. So this, in, in essence, is measuring whether things are more like a line or covering the entire plane. It's a bit of a simplification, but that's sort of the general idea. And now you really see uh, that it's learned very distinct uh, style groups in here, like groups of organization. And it's, what I thought was quite cool is that for, say, one value of organization index, you actually have several of these having all the same one. Right? So this, I, I haven't done this on simulation output, but this is sort of telling me, if I'm trying to understand what's physically going on, it's not enough to calculate just this number, because actually, there's all these guys which are different. Uh, Fractal dimension, and and similarly you could go the other way. There's ones that have similar fractal dimension but actually have different organization index, so they're either clumped together or not, and they're similar. Like, uh, well, it's not ratio to area to circumference, but it's a close approximation to that. Okay. So the, the the last thing I want to show you is something that I think is quite uniquely powerful when you have a neural network where you don't tell it what the answer is, because what I'm trying to argue here is that my neural network, it, it sort of understands similarity between cloud tiles, right? And that means that if you have 
a cloud type transitioning from one to another, you can actually study that transition. I mean, cats don't often turn into dogs, so this isn't something you would normally do with, with say, pictures of animals. But actually, that's what happens with clouds, right? They don't typically, I mean, some do uh, just form of dissipate, but a lot of the time, we're actually looking at transitions from one kind of carbonized state into, to another. And if you imagine in the embedding space, that would look like a path through there, right? Because every time it changes a little bit, it's going to be near where it was before. So I had a go at seeing if this was actually true. I, I took uh, a, a day of GOES imagery off the uh, southwest coast of uh, um, South America. And then I used uh, optical flow analysis to, so this is a bit of a, uh, I guess a, a hack, but it's basically they're using video compression. So this is a way of getting the flow from, from just directly from satellite imagery. And then what I did was I, I took uh, just a random set of these trajectories and I extracted tiles along these trajectories as, uh, as the clouds moved. So that's what you've got here in the bottom. You can see some of these. Um, so now it's not just one tile, right? It's like a sequence that all belong to the same trajectory. And I mean, it's quite cool. You can see that they're actually quite stationary with the flow, which is surprising. So this is, this is the actual trajectory. This is the samples. What was really cool, if you look then in the embedding space, and I am just looking at just two dimensions here that example, uh, show this, but um, I think it still captures it quite well. You move from like one, one area of the bedding space into the other. There's a bit of wiggling back and forth, probably when it's traveling through some of the other hundred dimensions. But they do at least make this, this path. And some of them make a part of the generation here, and some of them may be the beginning here, but they all map out something similar. And so then you can use this, um, this trajectory in the bedding space to actually composite. Right? You can say, okay, I want all the clouds that are here and here. And then you can start studying like what are the physics that go into that evolution now. Because now you have a tool that you don't have to define, okay, it's up to this factor dimension, this brightness, this and this to be at this exact stage of going from this type of cloud to this. You know, neural network has done that and said, okay, all of these uh, look similar by, by the constraints you've given me. And now you can study the evolution of it from one gene to another. Um, and I was going to show you. I mean, I'll for Eureka, this is very much work in progress, but I just want to show you what this kind of looks like. I took in uh, an image of the sea, so this cloud mask is inverted, so black is cloud. And I'm just showing you the first five components of the main space, but you can see here there's a region that one of the components is picking out this kind of cloud structure. And there's uh, the sort of I can't really see it on the hair, but there's like cellular patterns up there at the top that also exist down here. And it looks like this embedding is, but this component of the embedding makes that to pick that up. So if someone has a really good way of how to turn 100 dimensions into one color map, it's a great idea, and I'd be really excited, because that's kind of what I want to do. I want to take this image and overlay it and say, okay, this is this type of plan, this is this type of plan. But they're not linear, right? There's like these like, transitions between things in here, so it's quite complicated to work out how to actually do this. A heat map, they will call that, right? Yeah, it's a heat map, but then, but here I'm only using one component of the embedding, so right. I want to somehow contract them all into one number from, yeah, from blue to green or something. I'm not really sure what the right way is yet. I just thought I'd show this as like a motivation, maybe some of the, the people the, uh, yesterday would find this fun to do. Principal components was pretty successful, right? Yes. We find that 100 dimensions is really mostly three or four. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, yeah. my first plan is to, to use that now to, to make one component say the amount of red and the other component the amount of green, and then see the colors I get. Yeah. And maybe use the first three components so I also get blue. <laughs> but you know, there's many ways you can do this. So just thought, I I, anyway, so that's, that's it. That's the, that's the extent of my talk. So um, the, the main sort of summary here is I think it's, it's evident that you can uh, construct a neural network that will, without supervision, without being told what it's looking for, itself actually find patterns in data. And you can use um, what it predicts to actually learn uh, about what distinct features actually exist.
Um, and you can apply this to any geophysical field, right? It, I, it doesn't have to be clouds. It could be anything. That, it doesn't even have to be uh, atmospheric data. It could be whatever you want. I mean, probably you could apply it in 3D too, but I haven't tried that. So this is really just an extension of um, using convolutional neural networks to do something where things look like images. And, and as I mentioned already, it, um, um, uh, yeah, you can use it for this similarity between, between cloud structures, which I think is really cool. So that's all for me. Paper, uh, if you want to read more, but you also, I'm here until Friday late, so I'm very happy to talk about any of this. So, what you're calling structures in the previous uh, in your conclusions here is that the same as features? Types of structures is that what features is? You see, I, I think it's challenging because with the, with the neural network, you don't really know how deep into the layer it becomes a distinct feature, right? So maybe. Maybe for some of the, sometimes where it pushes in the embedding space, say, far left, that's just based entirely on what's in the first layer. Because all it's looking for is like, is there some repeating plan? And then sometimes it's using something further down, which is like a composite of that, to make the prediction of that component of the embedding space. Okay? So features becomes a bit more of a diffuse concept because it's sort of, it's sort of in the mind of the neural network. Yeah. And ideally you could pick that out, right? So. So I, I didn't go into more detail about this, but this type of network I'm using is called a residual network, where the weights start off, all of the matrices start off with just unity. So they just like, they take what came in and, uh, and then multiply it by one and remove the uh, sum all the things that are in there into one. They keep doing that down there. Which means that the, the, the actual transformation every layer by, by default doesn't do anything. And then what you're trying to learn is small perturbations around that. So you might find that some of your layers, you still have got mostly unity all the way down, and here's, here's the bit where I got the feature out. Then you could maybe find them, I don't know. Mm. That would be fun. Yeah? Oh, oh, we have a little time. Can you go back to the figure with the slices? Right, basically showing the figure. Um, this one? Yeah, maybe. Oh, this one here? Maybe it was before that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you got you basically you're taking this 256 by 2663 uh, array, right? Yeah. And also you're going to turn to this 1D embedding vector. Right. Okay. So each of those points is uh, information that was carried down for yeah. this particular. Um, I think what's um, right, like you said, you start out with all identity matrices. Yeah. Well, how does it change? Well, so, so you start out with identity and a small perturbation around that. Okay. So this, this was like a really big insight, in, I forget exactly, it's three or four years ago, mm -hmm. where someone realized that this, was, this made training so much faster. Mm -hmm. Because before what they had was, I think it was a 100 layer network, mm -hmm. and everything started off random. And it was mm -hmm. very hard for the network to get onto a track when it was actually improving. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you start with Unity, it's much easier. Right. But like if you take that little box you drew there and you do an operation to it, you're reducing it to a single number. Yeah. Okay. And then you're doing that again and again. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, but then what's the what's the iteration step, right? You said you're starting with small perturbations on the iteration. So what's the step that turns it into a new set of matrices? Okay. So what you do is you. So in my example, I have three images that go in. But okay. normally, let's say you just have one. So you feed one input image in, and then does this calculation over and over and makes this one vector. Right. And then you look at, uh, okay, so for me, I had, then I have three letters, and I look at, um, do they satisfy this loss function? Mm -hmm. well, they, they're not going to perfectly, right? And then I look at, if I change one number in here, mm. is that gonna make the loss go up or down? I see. And that's, okay, that one I, I should. Uh, you pick it randomly? Which, which you go through all of them. Oh, okay, all right, you're stepping through all. I mean, there's loads of strategies again for doing this, okay. but, but typically you look at, at all of them and you look at them, Layer by layer, that's where the back you start the first, the last yeah. layer, essentially. Right, because if you if you modify this one, then you can modi then you can work out if I change this one with this one, how does that make it happen? Okay. If I change the other way, how does it make it happen? Right. So then you're making changes, and you're seeing if the loss uh, does what you want, which yeah. is two get closer together, and, and the third one gets further away. Right. And it's trying to do both, right? Because I just I just have a minus sign between them. 
and maybe there's a more optimal way, but that's a way of weighting them together. And so, uh, so each of those each of those little prisms there represents like an operation, right? Yeah. That's okay. So like roughly how many of those are there between the beginning and the end? Like so I have 34 layers of my wow, 34 layers. But that's each. that's actually really shallow. So some of the like NVIDIA that work on the really big things. Right. If you want to really but each layer has multiple operations. Like the first one has several. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So okay. there are many so more. So it's like a pyramid, person. like a whole bunch of yeah. and less, and, and your pyramid is thirty-four deep. Yeah, and there's there's a, there's a width, a stencil. Like I I can't yeah. remember exactly whether it's three or five. Like oh, it's small. Yeah, it's small okay. because you want to just extract gradients uh, over five. Right. And there's yeah. there's some insight that goes into that as well. It's like over what length scale do you expect your your input right. to vary? Right. Uh, and techniques now where. You don't actually take all the numbers, but you take a random subset before you feed them through, or you like blur the input. There's all these, but from from even with something very basic, which is this is a ResNet 34, which is you can run on a mobile phone, and people do, you can still get something. Yeah. And then so, and then every iteration basically, is you do that, and you typically batch them together, so you do. Maybe well, it depends on the size of your GPU's memory, but maybe 32 or 64 examples, mm -hmm. and you look at the loss as a mean over all of those to remove some of the noise that you get if you're just trying to improve the loss for this one image. Mm -hmm. This set of images, sorry. Yeah. Uh, kind of on that note, um, I mean, so and someone asked this in your talk that you select the size of the slices, so. Yeah. I mean, isn't that going to affect hugely affect your what you get out in that 1D vector at the end? And that you're already sort of biasing the unsuper you're supervising it in a way, aren't you? By biasing the scale at which it sees these yeah. features and decides. Yeah. I mean, I'm biasing the way that you could argue it can't learn features that are bigger than that. Yeah. Right. Because they can't physically fix them at the time, mm -hmm. and it can't do anything smaller than the pixel I get out. Mm -hmm. But actually, and I was, that was why I wanted to show you that map at the end. There is, there is no sharp gradients in that map, right? When you look at this. Uh, sorry, it's such a poor plot, but I didn't have time to make it better. But this thing that I made at the end with the red. Yeah. There are no particularly sharp gradients in here, which is telling me that if I compare these two next to each other, it's actually learning features that are bigger then the style, since the style of this, maybe it's just that whatever is sort of determining the uh, texture of this feature doesn't vary very much in space. But it's allowing me to work on things that are bigger than the tile size. Right? Otherwise, this would be really noisy. But does that I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, but is that implicit in the, like the neighbor concept? It might, that might be my, why that works. I don't really know. I don't, but you're right, you're, you're biasing it to work at that specific resolution, absolutely. Well, another thing is like with this discussion of unsupervised, right? At some point, you have to say yes, it is a cat, or no, it isn't a cat. Yes, it is a cloud that you have picked out. I mean, in some ways, don't you make a determination of whether your unsupervised algorithm did do its job or not? Um, I do an interpretation, yeah, but I I think it's. It's an important distinction between having something that's limited to looking at only those four. Sure, yeah. To having a way to you yourself go in and investigate it. So with the, with the um, hierarchy, you know, I can focus down on one sub-element of this uh -huh. and keep splitting it down. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, I would argue, how I would look at clouds because it's not just like this playbook of just definitely this and definitely this. They vary on an enormous amount of scales, right? They're, they're basically fractal in nature. So you need something where these types exist inside of each other. Does that make sense? Otherwise, I'm yeah, it does. I, I guess to me, it's like the goal. The goal is ultimately to understand the physics, and then from the physics to then be able to say what's going on. Not just, hey, we have unsupervised learning, and we can just pick out whatever kind of features it decides are important. Um. So I, I guess that you want to get to a point where you understand why, what are the true differences yeah. that are meaningful in terms of the physics? Yeah. But I don't, I don't. Say, say there is a physics out there that you can use the physics to interpret. He's getting out there. Well, my understanding is that they don't have, that they don't quite understand how the clouds yeah, exactly. clump, so that they don't understand the, the Right, so he's using this to kind of 
categorize it in these similar scenarios that we can Right, but like, is that physically meaningful is what my question is. Ah, but that will, de that will depend on what you get out of the physics, right? So if, if you... I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let's, if I was saying, let's say there was a fifth class. I'm not saying there is, but let's say there was a fifth one. The only way you could be a neural network to do that in a supervised fashion was to come up with a lot of examples of that fifth class. And you'd have to do this and retrain every time you did that. And all you would know is that it's quite confident it's that. But what if it's 25% confident of all four? Like you have no way of knowing where, what, it's sort of, then you, it, the embedding space is in your mind suddenly. It's like, okay, how do the four classes I gave it relate to each other because it's now an intermediate between them. Whereas with this, you can actually go, you just keep throwing data at it, and it will, and it will find more and more different structures, right? It will concentrate them into little clusters. But, I think, but then you can composite over the part that you, th you think is interesting, and then look at the physical properties. And if they're distinct, and I would argue if that gives you enough insight to do some modeling, then that's, that's what you want. I mean, this is sort of shortcutting what we do when we look at pictures, <laughs> which is we take something, we look, okay, where's something interesting happening? Okay, so there, what happens? What's here? You know? It's just that you allow your computer to do it instead of, you know. The way I think of it is you've deferred the, the human interpretation step uh, from the realm of instances to the realm of classes. And uh, maybe human interpretation, maybe it's more scientific for humans to be interpreting classes than to be interpreting instances and then, uh, you know, training a machine to, to do our job for us. Yeah. <laughs> to do that job for us. Yeah, and, and it's also a lot faster, right? Like you have 30 years of satellite imagery, and this way you can look at it in just a short period of time. Does your data set overlap with that of analyzed in the RASP paper? I, they've, they've published that data now, so I'm, uh, that was about a month ago. So I've started looking at it, but I haven't had time yet. So I'm, basically my plan is to feed their images through my network and see if they cluster. My basement, ah, and they, do they make similar clusters to me, to, to what I see? Can I take the more than 50% of the cases that they didn't cluster and find other bits? That would kind of be the hope. Yeah, because my recollection is that they did impose a uh, physical interpretation of yeah. their stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so they went the kind of the other way. They sort of said, this is, we've, we've seen patterns, and this is what we think is physically happening. But I think that was also a means just to explain to people how to distinguish them. Because as we found out in the field campaign, is that it was kind of all of them. It's a bit of a mess, right? And now some of them didn't really happen so much, so, yeah. So I would view it very much as a tool to like gain insight from their data. And that's, for me, that's the really exciting bit here, is I'm not trying to build something that you take and you like say replace a GCM with it and it now models the entire climate just as well as the GCM did or maybe a little better. But you sort of give it a lot of data and then it comes up and say, oh, I found something interesting in your data. How about you look over here? And, and the, the nice thing is, right, it, it doesn't really care about what the data is that goes in. I can feed it all 13 channels of the satellite and it can extract patterns from, from there that I couldn't make up, right? Like, I, I, I probably wouldn't see fish and flowers if I could visualize 13 channels all at once and count them, right? But it would be a hard thing to do, unless a computer can do that. No so I guess that wasn't clear to me at the end. Did you end up with fish and flowers? I haven't looked for them. That was exactly a particular question. So now that they've published their data set, I'm going to try. Oh, OK. That was, that was a bit yeah. fish and flowers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess the point we were just talking about, like, this is, this algorithm could work awesome, right? And basically, in your 100 dimensional space, make these super tight clusters, right? But, you know, it seems unlikely to me it would happen, but conceivably, there would be no physical interpretation of it. That could happen. I mean, it seems unlikely, right? That you would then look at those and they wouldn't necessarily, or, or be in similar environments, for yeah, example. Yeah, I mean, so, so just from looking at this, it doesn't appear that happens because. Because you get transitions between regimes, and so it's more like you get these like paths mm. between these things, and that's, I mean, I think that would be totally awesome if you could do this on the whole globe, right. and suddenly get these high dimensional like things go to this and this, and but only go in that direction and never back. Right. Kind of thing. I just I don't have the time on the computer how to do that, but I think you, you would find it if you threw enough data at this, you would see those, and that's kind of what I started seeing with that one very the control experiment of like structure pureness uh, breaking up. Mm. Like, oh, it's all this path. Okay. So, what's the path for all the other stuff? What's the path for creating tropical cyclones? Yeah. 
Ah, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, it's a number of answers to that. that some of these training examples are going to be kind of just useless, right? Um, because they, they might contain just all the same kind of cloud, right? So, uh, and similarly, some tiles would contain clouds of different sizes and stuff, and they're probably going to be hard for the network to distinguish, right? But it doesn't mean it can't still work. So if you had a high proportion of that, if it, it was, if it was all just bad, you know, if it was all just like all sorts of random stuff, there's always a big thing and a small thing in every single image that just moved around, then the loss function would just stay high forever, right? Because it would never be able to do what I'm asking it to do, which is this distant tile definitely has to go far away from the neighbor there. So one thing I had a student work on last summer, yeah, anyway, recently, was to look at for every single tripler, what was the loss? And you see something really instant, you actually see which of the, because when it's trained right to the point where it's like, oh, I can't get any better, then you can look at all the triplets and you can actually work out which of the ones were uh, sort of insightful, ones that you could get a good loss for. And that, they could be sort of archetypes, right? Really pristine tiles, where it's like this one and this one are very similar and the one at far away is very distinct. And maybe that's a way of going about this, is to use more like that. So he was experimenting with that, like over something, that regime. I had a different concern, which was you saw that the distribution of types was very non-uniform. There was a lot more non-cloud than cloud. And so I was worried that my network was getting really good at recognizing non-cloud, but not the other stuff. And so I had him oversample that part in the middle space. But, yeah. but then, so we were looking at this. But I, yeah, I guess my answer is it's still useful, and you just, just forget about that. You just, as long as they're not in the majority, it's okay. Well, I hope my class can see why I'm making you read essays like what is science, as well as the nuts and bolts of this stuff, because <laughs> those two questions have to be brought yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the The nexus between those is our generation's, uh, you know, the next generation's uh, turf to define, I feel like. Anyway, so thank you very much. Uh, life, one more. Thank you. Uh, life is here. Uh, pretty busy getting through class tomorrow, which is about midday, but I'll, I'll set out a... Um, a uh, sign-up sheet for, for appointments if you want, probably uh, for a block of tomorrow afternoon and some of Friday. If people want to chat with him individually, I'll make that possible. Uh, tomorrow, second half of tomorrow and Friday. And um, I have to run off now, so if anybody would buy him the first round there at the wet lab, uh, that'd be much appreciated. And actually, if anybody can phone the UMIT help desk and help him get um, secure Kane's uh, permission on his Kane ID, uh, then uh, that, that's super uh, helpful too. Um, so if I so if one of you could uh, take over a little bit as host just this afternoon, I'd appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for coming out. <laughs>